morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone in the house of the Lord today. Uh, got some guests here with us today. Uh, Going to have some very special events today. So hope everyone it brings a blessing to your heart and that we bring a blessing to the Lord. Uh, if you would bow your head, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your house today to worship you, Heavenly Father, and to, to baptize these individuals that we're going to baptize today in your name. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we leave this place, that we leave this place with a heart that serves you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Going to stand up and welcome everybody this morning. Uh, before I do that, though, remind everybody, if, if you're a visitor in the pew, in the back of the pew in front of you, there's a little pamphlet. If you would, be sure and fill it out. Drop it in the offering plate. Uh, if you have a prayer request or anything you want to put on there, be glad to meet with you about that. I also like to tell you that if, if you uh, would like to join us and you need a ride, you can call the church office at 359-4077. We'll be glad to pick you up and bring you back home. Uh, so with that said, if everyone would please stand up and greet one another.
Good morning, good morning. I had to scoot my chair up because as somebody pointed out, we're raising true Baptists. They all just got as far back as they could. So I scooted up to be with them. This morning I want to talk to you guys about something. I brought something with me. I might get in trouble because I took it out of the house, but you girls may not know what this is. Look. It's a remote. Do you girls ever see that? Have y'all ever seen Ladies, have you ever seen one of these? This is a remote to the TV, and if you get your hands on it, you have done something special. Y'all know what the remote control does, don't you? It controls the TV. It controls what you're watching. It can control, some of them can control the DVR and the, just everything. The sound, is it really loud where you just go, uh, or is it just so low you can barely hear it? Depends on who you're watching, will you? You know. So whoever's got this in their hand has all the control. It's a scary thing. Girls, y'all want to hold it just in case you never get to hold one again? <laughs> it could happen. It could happen, I'm telling you. Well, control. Control is a big thing. Don't you like to feel in control sometimes? We all do. That's why men hang on to that remote control. It's, it's, a, it's a thing, you know, when I get it, I'm in control. That's why I want it so much, because I like to have control. But are we really in control of ourselves? Sometimes. But there's somebody else that has control over us, too. Y'all know who that is? Jesus. He wants to have control of us. You know why? It's not because he's a control freak. It's not because he's just got to have it that way. It's because he loves us. And he wants what's best for us. Let me read you a little, a little something out of Mark this morning. In Mark 1, they tell the story of Jesus coming into town, and there was a man there who had an evil spirit in him. And he walked up to that man, and he said, Be quiet. And the demon in that man calmed down. And the people were so amazed that they asked each other, What is this, a new teaching and, and with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. God has control of everything. And he's watching out for us. The thing is, we have to give control to him. If we make all the decisions and stay in control, you might find yourself in a mess sometimes. But if you turn your life over to Jesus and give him control and ask him for help, He's going to take care of you, and he's going to make sure that everything is going as planned because he has a plan for each and every one of us. So even if you do like to have control of yourself, which you have to keep some control because you can control a lot of the things, but in our life around us, let Jesus take care of some of that stuff, okay? Because he knows what's best for us, and he loves us more than anything. All right, let's say our prayers this morning. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just praise you for, for your love, for your grace, for your forgiveness, Lord. And, and I just pray that each and every one that, that is here this morning would, would give you control over our lives because we know you do love us and you do know what's best for us, Lord. I ask you to watch over us, guide, guard, and direct us today, Lord. It's in your precious name I ask it. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken from Romans Chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. It's page 960 in your pew Bible. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died in sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we can no longer be enslaved to sin. For no one has died, has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Let's prepare our hearts to come before the Lord. 
Let's bow together. Let us call upon our gracious God in these few moments together. Our Father, we give you praise and thanks that we are saved by grace through faith. It is your gift, not a result of our works. We thank you that your spirit has come to dwell in each of our hearts and lives. We who have trusted in you have received a, a gift, a powerful gift of eternal life in Jesus our Lord. And so we thank you that in this gathering today, in your presence, with the power of the Lord present with us, we thank you that wonderful things can take place. We're grateful that you are at work in our midst. We're grateful that you are still reaching out to save as many as will call upon you for salvation. And so we pray that in this hour of worship, in this time that we're together, that we may hear the gospel and that you would grant repentance and faith to every heart, every person in this place, even today. We ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and for his sake. Amen. Now would you please stand as we sing. Make me a blessing. <laughs> We've reached a time in the service where uh, it's time for us to give back a portion of what the Lord's given to us. So if you would, please bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you now uh, with many thanks. You've given us so much uh, that we never can even start to repay you, dear Lord. You've given us your son who sacrificed himself so we may live forever. Uh, you've given us everything without you we are nothing dear heavenly father be with us touch our hearts open our minds turn our souls over to you lord we ask all this in your name amen
stand as we sing, let others see Jesus in you. Well, good morning to you all and welcome to this time of worship. And uh, I would ask that you open your Bibles with me this morning to Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to look at simply two verses this morning. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Uh, Jesus had been crucified, dead, buried, and then on the third day he was raised to life. And he began presenting himself alive to those who had believed in him, to those who had followed him. Not to everybody, but to, to those who were closest to him during his, his earthly life. And one of the things that Jesus wanted to do was get all of those uh, 11 disciples together uh, to meet with him for a kind of a powwow, a kind of a time of uh, discussing what's next for them. And so he called those disciples together uh, to meet him in Galilee, where they could be alone and where they could uh, transact some business. And so when they came together, he gave them these instructions that you'll read in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Now, the imperative that Jesus placed upon the apostles and, and through them to the church in general and to us in, in particular was go make disciples. And that's, that's exactly what the commission for the church is. That's what our mission in the world really is. Um, and, and the point I want to make about that, if, if it's not you, then who? If you're not the one that he has sent to make disciples, then who has been sent? And that's, that's an important thing for us to consider. So everyone in this place should be convicted, this is my job, not the pastor's job. This is my job. This is something that Jesus wants me to do, to get involved in. But let me talk about one way that we can go about doing this task. Um, we can gather some together in a group. Uh, I've chosen to use this picture from uh, Strength to Stand, uh, of the kids that went to Strength to Stand. Um, one thing we want to do is we want to gather folks together in a setting, well, like they went to or like we're in to today. We've gathered together in this place, and something significant and important is taking place. Even if we don't see it with our natural eyes, there's something very important taking place in this in this place today. So we want to gather folks together. We want to invite folks to come and be a part of what's taking place here, what God is doing in, in our midst. And we need to do something else. We need to put them in an atmosphere of worship, instruction, fellowship, and evangelism. We want to put them, go back one. <laughs> no, no, the other way. <laughs> okay, we want to put them in a, in a, setting where worship, instruction, fellowship, and evangelism is taking place. So, so you see a, a crowded place, a place where there's a stage and there's a focus going on. And even though our church doesn't look like that place, uh, uh, we're just like that place in that, that God has called us together in a place where what we're involved in is, is, is worshiping the Lord. And we're giving instruction through the scriptures. We're learning what the scriptures have to say to us about about life. We're engaged in a time of fellowship where we're getting to know each other. We're growing in the relationship that we each have with Christ that brings us into a closer kind of relationship with each other. So that's what fellowship is all about. And, and the gist of all that is taking place here, one of the main things that takes place is that in this context, evangelism takes place. We're telling the good news. And we're trying to be a gospel-centered church, a word-centered church. So that's, that's important for us, that everything that we do somehow goes back to the truth of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised on the third day. That's, that's the truth of the gospel. So we put them in an atmosphere. And uh, by the way, those are God's primary purposes for the church. So if you want to kind of get those down, there's a little place in your worship folder that's called notes little blank space there, write the acrostic W-I-F-E. You can remember that word wife, right? And beside the W, write the word worship. And beside the word I, write the word instruction. And beside the word F, write, fe okay, come on, congregation, <laughs> fellowship. And beside the word E, write evangelism. evangelism. Okay, so, so, and then you get a sense of what God's purpose for the church is. And you can remember that because wife is a good, a good acrostic to remember that, uh, that kind of language. So, uh, so, and in the course of this event, we can ask ourselves, what should I do? What is it the Lord is impressing upon me to do with my life that he's given me through faith in Jesus Christ? In what ways does he point me to change? What differences does he want to make in my life? Or what are the things he wants me to work on? And, and what is my way forward in this faith? And these are the kinds of questions that we should all be asking every time we meet together in this context where we're worshiping and, and gaining instruction and fellowshipping together and uh, doing evangelism. We should be asking, what difference does God want to make in my life now? Now, uh, just remember that, that acrostic uh, wife, W-I-F-E. Um, now, I want you to know that the infant church learned when we come together to do that, the, what Acts 2.47 says is very important. Uh, Acts 2.47 says, And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, I've chosen this picture from Strength to Sand because these five kids 
independently and separately went forward during one of the times of invitation that was given at Strength to Stand. They each talked with a counselor other than our youth leaders. And so independently of each other, they had a conversation with someone who helped them clarify what God wanted to do in their lives. And of the three, two of them said, I'm a Christian already. What I really need to do is rededicate my life. I, I've, I've fallen by the wayside. I've begun drifting, you know, that, whatever. And so they talked to the counselor, and the counselor told them that what you need to do is, is uh, rededicate yourself. And so when we talked uh, in my office after this event, that's what we determined to be the reality for them. Three of them had never trusted Christ before. And so they came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. They asked Jesus to come into their lives. They trusted him for salvation. Uh, and they're hearing again and again and again the truth that we hold dear here, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, that for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are God's workmanship who have been created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We hold that dear. That, those are our marching orders. That's what makes us Christian. No good works that we do, but we're saved for good works. That's important. So five of our kids responded. Three of them trusted in Christ. And today we're going to baptize them as they confess their faith. Now, when you invite somebody to come to your church and you give them a true life uh, card, like you see on the, on the picture before you. Uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted for just a moment. <laughs> when you invite somebody, you're asking them to come and see. You're, you're asking them to come to this context where we're engaging in worship and instruction and fellowship and evangelism. You're asking them to come uh, so that that in that context, they can come to know uh, Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we're, we make no apology about that. We're unashamed about the fact of the gospel, so we want that to take place. And by the way, how many of you passed out True Life cards this week? Can I see your hands? It's a good bunch of you in the congregation, all right? Now, when you did that, how many of you felt good about it? Now, put your hands down. And, and how many of you thought, this is the easiest way to do evangelism that I have ever encountered in my life before? Can I see your hands? Okay, yeah. How many of you went to the truelife.org uh, website and took a look there? Can I see your hands? Well, the rest of you that didn't, you need to go look at truelife.org and you'll discover some interesting things about that. that. The great thing about using these cards when we are trying to invite people to come and see is that you don't have to answer all their questions. In other words, if they have questions about Christianity or about the faith or about some social uh, uh, concern that matters to all of us in the world, they can go to truelife.org and they can find that video and they can study it for themselves and they can do it in, the, in privacy and not under pressure from any one of us. And, uh, and I think there's a great tool there. So I want to encourage you, pass those cards out. Please, just keep on passing those cards out. And I'm going to keep on asking you about it every Sunday for a while, okay? And can I hear an amen? Okay, we're going to do that. And if you've passed out all your cards and you need more, in a box right over here on the table, there are more cards. So please, keep your, uh, keep your quiver full of those little arrows and... Uh, and take them with you and, and share them with the, with the people. Now, when you invite someone uh, using True Life uh, cards, then, uh, then you're asking them to come and see. Now, when we go make disciples, our first duty is baptizing them, according to Jesus. Their first step in discipleship is to be baptized. So that's a priority of things that take place after one gets saved after one becomes a Christian. The first thing is baptism. The first thing that we must do. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Um, 
let me give you a, an illustration from scripture about how this thing works. Uh, there was a young deacon, uh, one of the early deacons of the, of the early church, one of the first deacons of the early church, was traveling down a road, and he happened upon uh, a guy that was riding along in a, in a chariot, and he overheard the guy reading the text of scripture that comes from Isaiah 53, which is called the Suffering Servant Passage. And uh, so he was wounded for our transgressions and chastisement for our peace fell upon him. All we like sheep have gone astray, have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has uh, uh, turned upon him the, the iniquity of, all, of us all. You know, great passage, but the guy didn't really understand it. So Philip, seeing that the guy didn't really understand the passage, got next to him and said, can I help you with that? Can I help explain that scripture to you? And so the, the eunuch invited him to come up in the chariot, and they rode along for a while. And Philip explained the meaning of the scripture and helped to talk to him about who Jesus is from that Old Testament passage of scripture. And uh, when you get to uh, verse 35 in chapter, uh, of, uh, chapter 8 of that, the book of Acts, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And, and here's my sense of what that means, is that he came to faith. He believed. He trusted in what that message was all about. He said, This is my hope. This is my salvation. So when they came to the place where there was water, he said, Philip, why don't you baptize me? I believe. I believe. So it's important for us to understand that. Uh, so the answer to the question, who should be baptized, is believers. Uh, believers make a public confession of their faith in Jesus when they are baptized. That's what they are doing. Nothing magical happens. Uh, they are confessing, I believe in Christ. But something significant is taking place at the same time because a congregation of people like we are today is acknowledging their faith in Jesus and welcoming, welcoming them into the family or embracing them as fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. That's an important concept for us here. So when they confess their faith and we acknowledge their faith, then, then we bring them into the life of a of a, living as a Christian and we help them and we, we join them in that process. So the church is here to acknowledge what these three young women are going to confess in just a little while. And the answer to the question, how shall they be baptized, is by immersion. Um, that word baptize is a great little word. Uh, there's, there's a main word that means to put under and keep under and stay under. That's, that's bapto. And, and that, that you, you, you submerge, so that's what that word is. This word is, is sort of a diminutive expression like that. So you dip or you dunk, you know. And those are good words, a good translation for, for what this word is. So you're, we're going to put them under temporarily, but not forever, okay? So don't be afraid. Uh, I threatened some of these girls. I said, if you give me a hard time up there, I'm going to hold you down longer than you need to be. Okay. <laughs> That would be bapto. Baptism would be putting them down and bringing them back up, okay? So that's, that's what it is. And, and the reason that we talk about doing it by immersion here, even though the church in history has practiced all kinds of forms of baptism, uh, and too many for me to talk about today, uh, the, the word picture itself kind of corresponds with what happened uh, in the life of Jesus. The gospel writers all describe Jesus at his baptism as coming up out of the water, which implies, suggests th that he was under the water and that he came up out of the water. I mean, John the Baptist was baptizing down at the creek, and so that's, what, that's what's happening there. Um, so we Baptists embrace this idea of, of uh, baptism by immersion. Now, the act of baptism itself is a picture, it's a symbol of the beginning of a new life. And uh, I, I chose this picture because I liked all those guys holding their hands up. It looks happy, doesn't it? Doesn't, doesn't look scary. Not like it'd be a scary thing to do in church. I know we Baptists are afraid to raise our hands. Uh, but, uh, but 
But when you realize that you have a brand new life, that the life of God has come to dwell in you, that you have a marvelous gift of eternal life, when, when you realize what's so significant about this moment, this, this event, and what it means, the symbolism is there, then, then all you can do is, is just praise God. I have a new life. He has given me a new life, and it's different from my old life. And it's better than my old life. And it's going to la- outlast my old life. It, everything about it is, is better because of the faith that we have in Christ. And, and I can illustrate a couple of things from, from some passages of Scripture. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says, We were buried with him, therefore, in baptism, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So the suggestion is that believers have a new life in which they can now live. Or 2 Corinthians 5.17, here's a testimony to the new life that we have in Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away. I love the way that Paul wrote that because he said, they're gone. Completely, totally gone. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come to be. And he talks about the ongoing reality of the new things that are a part of our lives. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. You who trusted Christ 30, 40, 50 years ago are a new creation in Christ. Just like these young women who will be baptized in a few moments are new creations in Christ. That's the joy of the gospel because it's new life. It's not a renovation of your old life, reformation of what you once were and try, trying to do better at it. It's new, brand new. It's the life of God in you. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, we are his workmanship, newly created in Christ for good works. You want to know the role that good works has in the life of a Christian? It is not in order to become a Christian, it's because we are Christian. We were created in Christ for good works, saved for good works. So, I'm I'm talking about a new life, a brand new life, a wonderful new life that every one of us in this place can come to have and possess and have as our own by the gift of God. And all that we need to do is trust in Jesus. I want to tell you my story very, very briefly. It's been a long time ago now, but I like remembering this story. It was on a Monday night in October of 1973. This is, I don't remember the date exactly, but I remember the experience. So on that night, I prayed for the first time very simple prayer. I prayed, Lord, save me. And a friend of mine had witnessed to me, and he said, it's all about asking Jesus into your heart, asking Jesus to come into your life. So I kind of added to my prayer, Lord, save me. I kind of said, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me. Take me to heaven. You know, some, stuff like that. And, and I, I prayed that. And I, I, I laid down. I was in my room. Uh, I laid down and uh, went to sleep next morning I got up to go to work and without knowing the real truth of this but having discovered later on when I got up the next morning and prepared to go to work I said to myself I'm a Christian now my life will be different and that's the reality of the gospel when you put your faith in Christ you become a Christian and your life will be different from now on. And I want to say to you, if you've never had that experience, if you've never come into that kind of a relationship with Jesus, you can right now. His invitation is always open. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, is what the Bible says. So if you will simply trust in Him, you don't have to know all the ins and outs of theology. You don't have to be a a great Bible scholar to know all of this stuff. All you have to do is know the gospel. Christ died for your sins. He was buried and raised on the third day. He's taken sin, your sin, out of the picture. 
And he's made himself available to you for the gift of eternal life. And you can have him today if you will just trust in him. And we want you to have that opportunity. So before we go baptize, I want to ask, is there anyone in this place who wants to come into a right relationship with God through putting their faith in Jesus Christ? And we're going to stand and sing a song in just a moment. We call it our invitation hymn. If that's for you, if that's what you want, if something on the inside of you, the Spirit of God is bearing witness, that's what you need, we invite you to come. Let's bow together, then we'll stand and sing. And you come as the Spirit of God will move you to come. Our Father, in these quiet moments, I pray that you would bless this time of decision, that many in this place will come into a right relationship with you simply by trusting in Jesus. I pray that you'll bless this word. I pray that you'll bless this uh, time of response. And I pray that you'll be glorified in the midst of it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing our invitation hymn. And you come. The Spirit of God will lead you. And, and ladies, this is your time to go. Okay? turn, we'll sing, uh, I believe it's four is the hymn, To God Be the Glory.
joyful occasion brings us together to today. Amen, church? Amen. All right, yeah, this, this wonderful time. Believing that a person who puts their faith in Christ automatically becomes a Christian is the reason that we celebrate this baptism today. I want to present to you three young women who have trusted in Christ. And we have talked with them about their faith, and we're convinced that this is genuine. This is the real deal that's taking place today. And so I ask you, church, to acknowledge their faith and to rejoice with them as we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is Madison Herring. Madison because you've asked Jesus to come into your life, because you've trusted him to give you the gift of eternal life. It gives me a great joy to baptize you as my little sister in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> You glad I didn't tell you that? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's not. <laughs> what you all don't know is that as of yesterday, we had absolutely no heat in the baptistry. We've got a little now, but not enough, I'll tell you. Taylor, because you've asked Jesus to come into your life, because he commands me to baptize you in his name, it gives me more joy than you can know to baptize you as my little sister in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> okay, Chloe, it's your turn. And the secret is out. <laughs> yes, it is. You're handling it like a champ, though. <laughs> okay, it's freezing. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. I'm sorry. Okay. Grab my hand. Thank you. Thank you. This is Chloe Martinez. And she has put her faith in Jesus, and because she has, it is my joy to see you as a little sister in Christ and to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you. I'm, I'm bad about it. If I don't write it down, I won't say it or do it, so I wrote it down. But uh, happy birthday to Katie Bryan and Terry Wallace, and we celebrate their, uh, their physical birth today. We're not going to sing today, but happy birthday, Terry. It's good to see you, buddy. Uh, do check your worship folder for the announcements that are there, uh, and uh, so we can, uh, you can know what's taking place in the life of the church, and I won't have to read those again to you. And uh, also, in your prayer list, that long prayer list, be sure and pay attention to continue praying for folk and praying for one another in the needs that we have right now. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, if you need more True Life cards, they're over here on this little table. Just pick some up and take them with you and just invite folks to come to church and give them a true life card. And uh, you'll be blessed if you'll do that. Now, let's bow our heads for the benediction and we'll conclude our time together. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely in spirit and soul and body and preserve you blameless till the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is faithful who calls you, and he will do it. In the name of Jesus, the name above all names, the strong name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen.